All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Humanizing Your Brand webinar series presented by Online Optimism. I'm your host, Sam Olmsted, and throughout this series, you'll be learning how to connect with your audience, build trust with your customers, and grow your organization by creating a human brand with a more personal touch. Each week, we have been and we are presenting with industry-leading experts who have proven track records and insider tips that will help reshape your brand's focus and the core messaging that you're trying to present to your customers. Before we get started, let's discuss the format of this webinar. Each speaker will present for about 20 minutes, and we'll have a 20-minute Q&A after both presentations are complete. Um, please feel free to participate and drop in questions as we go along. Uh, there's a Q&A chat at the bottom of the screen, so feel free to uh, drop your questions there. If there are questions about the format of the presentations or the webinar process, uh, then we can answer those as we go. But if there are questions for the speakers themselves, then what we'll do is we'll hold those questions till the end, and then I'll read those aloud at the end of the presentation. As your host, I have muted all of the attendees throughout the webinar to cut down on any background noise. But again, please feel free to add your thoughts uh, to the chat as we go. Last thing is we will be posting this webinar online. We have a, a recording of it, just as we've done with our, our previous webinars. Um, so you'll be able to revisit those and go look for uh, more information if you would like. All right, let's get started. This is our fourth week of the Humanizing Your Brand webinar series, and I'm pleased to introduce not one but two speakers to start today. We've got Levon Lewis and Sherrod Shackelford. Levon Lewis is one of the nation's most respected authorities on branding, design, and marketing, and he's the co-founder, president, and creative director of Connect Branding, an Atlanta-based award-winning branding and marketing firm. Levon transforms conceptual ideas into signature brands for companies all over the world. Sherrod Shackelford is the co-founder, CEO, and chief strategic architect of Connect Branding. Launching his first business at the age of 15, Sherrod uses, used his talents to help businesses maximize their web and commercial presence, earning this up-and-coming young professional his first paycheck of $5,000. Sherrod also boasts over 300,000 homegrown social media followers across Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Connect Branding has worked with some of the biggest brands in the world, such as SeaWorld, Home Depot, and Panasonic. Together, Levon and Sherrod have earned their way to being some of the most sought after branding and marketing professionals in the nation, as noted by Black Enterprise Magazine. Take it away, Levon and Sherrod. Hi, and thank you for uh, inviting us here this morning. We look forward to the presentation. I'm going to share my screen and then we can get started. All right, so the name of our presentation is Make Them Buy, Build a Million Dollar Business Brand and Attitude. And we call it Make Them Buy because when it comes to business, creative branding is all about the buy-in. And so we're going to, to get to it and just break down the psychology of how we think branding works and how uh, it connects to marketing. As you mentioned, some of our clients are Home Depot, Aflac, AT&T, Panasonic, to name a few. And we won about 50 awards doing so. Um, what we focus on is mobile technology, uh, websites and social media, branding and consulting, strategic marketing, app and software development as well. And we believe all of these things work together because branding is the culmination of everything that you do from all of these tools to customer service, uh, to even down to your location, to how you communicate. And so we're going to discuss that today. Uh, where I would start is to say that the majority of the world underestimates the importance of design. And when I say that, I believe that good design is invisible. Um, when you go into the Apple store or when you open up a package from Amazon, you don't really think about the design. But if it's really good, you know, it, it's, it's invisible, as I would say. So good design is functional as well as aesthetically pleasing. It, it serves a purpose. It communicates what needs to happen. Um, also, when you talk about branding itself, branding is how you communicate value. Um, when you go into business or even as an individual in the world, we all have value. We all offer something. And no one would know that you exist, your service exists, or anything like that if you didn't properly communicate it. So the difference between what branding is and what marketing is, is that branding is communicating that value, discovering why you're different, 
and marketing is this, the distribution of that message, which could be social media, commercials, things of that nature. About 80% of what, what our brain does every day is analyze everything from a visual perspective. We call it visual perception. And so it's the largest part of the brain. And in a matter of seconds, we, we look at things and we comprehend it, whether it's color or whether it's fonts, icons, things of that nature, web, we comprehend it and make decisions about it. So if we break down exactly how color works in business, if you look at a Harvard study, most of what we do on the day-to-day -day is process things subconsciously, right? Over 95% to be exact. And so what that means is that if you use the psychology of branding properly, you can persuade um, buying. You know, so you look at most banks, for an example, about 60% or so use blue because it, it's a color of trust, security, and things of that nature. If you look at one of the largest rebrands in the world, um, they spend $1 billion on it, that would be McDonald's, right? And so we know McDonald's uses red, yellow, things of that nature as an example, and red seems to stimulate hunger in the restaurant industry, which is why a lot of restaurants use that color. If you look at the former McDonald's versus the current, that $1 billion was used slightly to evolve the brand. They didn't change the recipe, they didn't change the burgers, anything like that. But it would the, the color palette slightly changed because they understand their market and who they're trying to attract. And so while you're talking about design and things of that nature, I think it's really important to know what you really sell. So I handed the baton to Sherrod to break down what you really sell and understanding that concept. So the the I guess the topic today is humanizing your brand. And one of the things that I wanna make sure I tie in with what LeVon was laying out is that a big part of making sure that your brand connects and is relatable is color. And what he wants to really emphasize is that the psychology of color is crucial and you know mutually exclusive to how your brand is received on a human and emotional level. So, you have to understand that if you're going into a particular industry, understanding how to communicate what your message is to that particular market starts at the fundamental building blocks of every element of what you do. From not just the product you sell, not just your business plan, not just your strategic partners, but even all the way down to every single word you say and every single color you select. It communicates a message. It, it, it orchestrates a position, right? Which is what people will, I guess, use to relate and understand who you are as a business. But the number one thing that I would want you to walk away, we've got 20 minutes, so we've got to do this quick. The one number one thing I want you to walk away with is really understanding how to determine what you really sell, which will inform everything you do. So the reason I have this McDonald's on screen is because I'm pretty sure you've never seen this McDonald's, right? No one's ever seen a McDonald's, a two-story retro McDonald's that looks this cool, right? But well, obviously you've got like your hard rock McDonald's down in Vegas and those things, but this one is different. So the reason I chose this one, and usually this is an opportunity for call and response, but due to COVID, I won't be able to hear your responses. So keep that. But what I will say is this right here is a special McDonald's because it's a great opportunity to point out that McDonald's is actually two businesses. The first business that most of us know is burgers. But I would challenge you to say that McDonald's doesn't even sell burgers. McDonald's, I would even say, is not even a restaurant. I'm gonna tell you why. Because what McDonald's does is they lease access to the menu, to the logo, to the brand, to franchisees who buy in. And then it's my job as a franchisee to sell the burgers. But what McDonald's does is real estate. They own the land that the McDonald's is on. And that's where they're the number one real estate organization in America. Why? They own more land than any other business because that is their primary business. And then they lease to us and we sell the burgers for them on their land. Now, all of us can't have a dual business like that where we have real estate and burgers. I know that's a weird you know, mix, but you know, McDonald's is lucky to do that. But the reason I use them as the example is because most times we don't realize that our business is also a duality. We, you know, let's say you are a stylist, personal stylist of sorts. You sell hair products and, you know, you, you groom people. But what you're also selling is confidence, 
right? So there's two pieces of what you do. There's the confidence piece, and then there's the actual execution of your business. The most important part of what you sell is the confidence piece, not the function, right? So if you are a, I don't know, insurance company, you sell insurance, you sell policies, but your actual product is peace of mind. Your actual product is legacy, right? So when you talk about humanizing your brand, you cannot humanize an insurance policy. It's only so many ways you could say $250 a month for $500,000 worth of insurance, right? But when you talk about know that your children will rest easy, right? That's human. But you can only get to that point when you know that you sell peace of mind, right? So I want everybody in the room to think, what is the emotional element of what you sell? I'll give you a fact. 100% of purchase decisions that are not driven by price or financial limitation are driven by some emotional trigger. It's not necessarily that it's, you know, this, this car is pretty. Yeah, it's a pretty car, but it also reminds you of your father's car, right? And then that reminds you of the nostalgia of your feeling for your dad. And it reminds you of how free your father was when he drove that car. So when you bought the car that reminds you of your dad, you bought your car because you wanted the sense of liberation that your father had when he drove the same car, right? So yeah, it's a nice car, but the emotional connection that you had to the car is the reason you purchased it. So what you have to do as business owners is understand what emotional space you occupy. And you guys let me know on time. I don't want to run over, make sure that we um, are good on time. So I want to pass the mic to LaVon because LaVon goes in on this piece. LaVon, talk a little bit about how when you're setting up a business, how understanding your emotional position can help you when it comes to what type of strategic partnerships you should look for, help you when it's time to curate other income streams. In terms of making those decisions, how does understanding the emotional space that you occupy assist you in that area? Um, I think it's very important. I think you make a good point about McDonald's and things of those natures. I think understanding what you sell does govern every decision, you know, moving forward. It governs even your positioning in your market. It governs, you know, knowing the difference between you and a competitor and knowing the difference between all of your products. Um, Sherrod, an example that you use a lot is that we'll take like movie theaters, for an example, as far as knowing what you sell. Uh, you mentioned all the time that it's a relationship building tool, you know, so and what they really sell is I think of a movie theater as like really a restaurant with a big TV screen in it, in my opinion, uh, because movie theaters don't really make a lot of money on the movie itself, which is why the cost of the food is so high. So it's really a relationship building tool to get to the next step with whoever you're with. So let's go over to Waffle House. I want to I want to use the Waffle House example. So, okay. so really quick though, this is always really funny when we do this live, when you go to the movie theater, you get popcorn, <laughs> you get soda, you get, you get uh, candy, and then it costs you how much? 579. <laughs> right? <laughs> because we know that, and, and see, and here is one of the benefits of knowing what you really sell. None of us would spend, now let's be more realistic. In a movie theater, these three items could cost you as much as $30, right? But you know that you could get that Sour Patch Kit for two bucks at the gas station. And you know you could get that Coke for three bucks and that popcorn, five of them for five bucks. But you'd pay $30 in a movie theater for that. Not because of the movie, because the movie is not they, what they really sell, but because they understand how important it is to humans to build relationships with other humans, it puts a tax on that, Sour Patch Kid, because you're going to the movie. A lot of people go to the movies by themselves, but I would venture to say that 80% plus of movie ticket sales are with two or more because it's a relationship building tool. Now, the way they price the candy is based on understanding the demand on building relationships, not movies. So when you understand what you really sell, if I were to open a movie theater without knowing what I really sell and not without knowing the emotional elements of it, I would have sold the, cow, the Sour Patch Kid. I buy them for $1, I sell them for $1.50. $2. That's what I would have done. But now that I understand that the emotional space that I occupy as a business, which is relationship building, I know the value of that. So I know that the dad with his daughter that he hasn't seen in a year and they're going to their first movie for after a while. And she says, dad, I want something to drink. Oh, I can tax you for that, brother. Oh, I, I, you're gonna have to pay me for that one. You know, cause that's an important drink right there. Or the young lady that you've been waiting to talk to for 
two months and she hadn't had time. And finally, you get her out on that date and she says she wants some popcorn. Oh, brother, you got to pay me for that popcorn. You know what I mean? Because I understand the emotional element that you're actually buying. You're purchasing the relationship, not popcorn. So when I understand the emotional element that I sell, it informs so many different decisions. If we go to Waffle House, for example, with Waffle House, Waffle House does not pro provide Wi-Fi. Waffle House actually doesn't really give you any additional amenities. If anybody has ever been to Waffle House, there's no cushions on the seats. They squeeze the the, uh, the chair. You have to like, you can barely fit in when you're sliding in. They give you plastic forks and spoons and they give you the check. As soon as they give you the food, get out. Because they understand that convenience is, they are a sit down, dine in, fast food restaurant. It is not their business plan to provide Wi-Fi because they don't want you to stay. They know that the average person stays in Waffle House for 17 minutes. They realize that if that number goes up to 18 minutes, they lose millions across all of the Waffle House franchises in America. So their goal is to make sure that number stays as low as possible at all times. That's why they're always overstocked with cooks. They don't even have time to walk the food back to the kitchen. They cook it right, right, at the, right in front of you. As soon as you walk in, they cook it at the door. Get out. We have to keep that number down because they understand that convenience is what you're purchasing. You like the food, but you want to get in and out. My point here is when you're humanizing your brand, the first step of humanizing your brand is understanding the emotional space that you occupy because it is the most powerful tool you will have for learning how to scale and expand your business the right way and how to connect to your customer and create consistent sales. And there we are. How are we on time, guys? Cause, cause we, good. You've got about you know three to five minutes if, if possible, but you know. Okay, yeah, oh yeah. We, oh, we can roll for the next two days. We got you. Brother. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the next piece, if you'll back up a little bit, or, or actually, you can go ahead. So everybody recognize this. This is Doug. So I go back. Yeah, no, it's fine. You can leave it right there. So here's the thing that's really interesting to me about this. So Dove understands that. People are so driven by emotion that they could sell you the same exact product in two different bottles and create a whole new market. Because the reality of this is the left product and the right product are 100% scientifically the same thing. They are, they are the exact same thing. Obviously they change the fragrance, but they may not even have to because how many ladies are gonna pick up that gray bottle and see what it smells like purchasing for themselves, right? Nobody, but because, but why is that? Why would the ladies never pick up the bottle? Going back to LaVon's point, color, right? Look at that color, look how important color is in this. Gray is decidedly for men, pink is decidedly for women, this is all on a psychological and emotional level. But what is in that bottle is the same exact thing. And they know that. So the only reason that they created a new bottle called it Men Plus Care, the fonts are different. The color is different. The shape is different on the same exact product because they understood it would open up a new market. Let me see the next slide. How much did they make with, just by changing the bottle? 125 million more dollars per year by giving you the same thing in a different bottle because we make decisions emotionally right and because of that you as business owners have to understand and i know the next guy is going to be getting into emotional design so i can't wait to hear what he has to say about these things so this this is hopefully everybody should leave this thing pretty emotionally high you know after <laughs> after we get done but i want you to walk away with the fact that emotional listen, business owners, entrepreneurs, we focus on product development like none other, right? We sit there and we curate to make sure we have the best product. But I'll tell you something, Beats by Dre is a case study for you. Beats by Dre was reviewed by Time Magazine and they were rated 17 out of 18 in terms of quality and performance when it comes to headphones. Essentially dead last, right? But they have 7% market share, 70% market share, 1.5 billion in revenue. 
the cost of production is $14, which means you can basically get these in a gas station, right? Now let's look at the next one. Let's skip that one. Wait, there was the one, uh, well, we'll get to those. Go back, I think there was a slide before. You, you know what, we saw it there. Which brand? No, 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 you're good, we can stay here. Okay. 17 out of 18. So the question I, I would ask the audience is, how could some of the worst headphones on the market have 70% market share, be $14 per to make, which is no different from, from your Sony headphones or your Bose headphones. How are they dominating? Because they occupy the emotional space. Think about it, status. The only headphones on the market that effectively communicate status. You could go to that gas station and buy the little walk Sony Walkman headphones, but it doesn't mean that you're cool, right? It doesn't mean that you're hip. You know, it doesn't mean that you have an extra dollar to spend on certain things. So if you're interested in communicating status, Beats by Dre is the option. And that's how they took over the market. The headphones are crap. So when we sit, when we sit down and focus on product development as business owners, it's a good thing. I think it's a good thing to have a good product. I would always encourage it. But I would challenge you to understand that your vehicle for distributing and communicating the value of that product and, and occupying the emotional space is more important. So you can't slack on having a good product, but you definitely can't slack on understanding what emotional space you occupy so that you can humanize your product to the people and that they will want to buy it for a reason, which is association. They want to be associated. I want to buy the Mac because I want to be associated with what Mac represents. I want to buy the Mercedes because I want to be associated with what the Mercedes represents. I want to buy Nike because I want to be associated with what Nike represents. So using, by occupying the right emotional space and then causing people to desire association is the building blocks for long-term sales. Levon, you want to add to that? Or are we out of time? Let Sam let us know. You're great. If you have a, a you know a final thought or another another thing you want to add on there. Mr. Lewis. No, I, think, I, I think we'll get into it with the QA. So we'll pass it to JP. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you so much for that great presentation. I think it was really interesting. First, I want to say I have that Dove Men Plus Care uh, deodorant. <laughs> so not sure if I should feel good about that or not. So, but uh, I'll do I Sam. <laughs> okay, <good. laughs> Um, but it was really interesting. I definitely have some some good Q and A uh, for you uh, after this. Um, I like what you said about good design being being invisible, and the psychology involved in it is is super interesting. So, for everyone listening, please feel free to uh, to jot down some questions in the Q and A chat. We can ask those after JP is done with his presentation. Um, and remember, because you're muted, I'll I'll compile these questions and ask them aloud uh, when everyone's all done. Okay, thank you so much again, uh, Levan Sharad. Uh, we're going to move on to our next speaker, Juan Pablo Madrid, who's going to talk about crafting a brand through emotional design. But before he starts, let's get to know JP a bit more. As design director at Online Optimism, Juan Pablo, or JP, leads all design projects from brand identity creation to website development. He takes creative approaches to simplifying information while ensuring consistency and aesthetics. Since joining Online Optimism, JP has launched dozens of websites for clients across the country and has proudly created materials such as infographics and animations for clients in a variety of industries. So take it away, JP. Thank you, Sam. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen there. Everyone can see it? Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, so as Sam just mentioned, uh, I'm going to talk to you all a bit about emotional design uh, to trail off uh, to where Levon and Sharad uh, left off. So first off, again, um, JP and I run the design and development department at Online Optimism and oversee all design, animation, and web projects. Um, I have previous experience in design for higher education at the University of New Orleans and for consumer goods in PepsiCo in Latin America. And I grew up in Guatemala City and moved to the U.S. in 2012. And I know this isn't a very recent picture, but I just wanted to, I found it recently. And um, really, I, ever since I can remember, I was uh, doing something creative. I think the only thing that has changed are my dinosaur pajamas. So uh, as 
we begin, I just wanted to take y'all on a super quick journey through time. Um, so there was a time where uh, products such as clothes, furniture, technology looked like this. They really reflected craftspeople, artisans who left their touch in everything uh, they do. And so now we have this, uh, this. So how did we get to it? And really the answer is with the dawn of the industrial revolution, mass production and uh, higher profits uh, superseded craftsmanship. Function became king. And I really don't wanna go uh, after the people who created these because they're a reflection of the technological advancements that um, have happened through time. And um, really they're just a, a product of that. But function became king and style was sort of left behind. And it really hasn't only happened with clothes or furniture. Our user interfaces look like this. And while I'm not a huge fan of the green felt or the fake wood, uh, there was something inherently human about these interfaces and something relatable that made us understand them how to use them whenever all these digital products started coming out. But in that same way, function superseded style. So if you open any of your apps, most of them will probably look like this, except maybe in the last year, they have now have dark mode. And again, the quest for simplicity hasn't cap has also captured whole brands as well. Uh, we can see the recent rebrand of BMW from being a more dimensional logo to something flat and in my opinion, unappealing. The infamous Gap attempt to rebrand or even the new Google icons who y'all may have seen a lot of tweets about. Um, for any anyone uh, in the audience who is into like the design of some of these products, uh, you probably know that the, that first set of logos were based on a very human study of uh, how we interact with our human, with our um, user interface is called material design. But while some of their apps reflect that, their icons clearly don't. And now it takes me about a minute or two sometimes to figure out what icon belongs to what. And so we arrived to the concept of sameness, uh, which really has overtaken a lot of things from the clothes we wear, the furniture we buy, uh, even the coffee shops we visit. Um, you probably all have been in the same coffee shop with a very eclectic look, same kind of music, uh, same kind of smells. And uh, sameness obviously just means a lack of variety, uniformity and monotony. And that all comes from the fact that creativity is shaped by constraints. Uh, so we'll do a quick little exercise. Um, really, whenever you uh, tackle a creative challenge, your outcomes really depend on these four constraints, uh, ourselves and our background, our environment, such as the place we live, um, our uh, others. So for example, if you work in marketing, what your client has set, out, set you out to do, and really the creative decisions we take, such as if maybe you're only used to using four typefaces or you're only used to using the same sets of tools. So many of us, arrive to a decision right in the center of those four constraints. Um, it's really the uh, path, of least, path of least resistance, but sometimes that isn't creative enough. It addresses a lot of the issues that maybe you're trying to tackle, but it's boring and it's probably, it probably has been done already. You might go all the way outside of the box, think, thinking outside of the box, but um, does that really solve the issue that you're trying to tackle? Um, it might look cool, it might look super different, but we may be ignoring some very important things within that box. And uh, again, we really haven't arrived at a solution. So where else do you go? Well, you can just redefine your constraints. Uh, you can make that box a little larger. You can uh, think beyond your background look beyond out, outside of your environment and the things you're used to. Uh, you can look beyond maybe those needs that your client has right now and anticipate some of those that they'll have in the future. And you can always just learn new things and explore new approaches to whatever you're doing. So to illustrate this with a more concrete and sort of historical example, um, this is a map of the London underground as it looked in like uh, the early 1900s. 
Uh, and you can only imagine maybe arriving in London for the first time, going down to the tube and seeing this spaghetti mess. Uh, it was very, it was geographically accurate uh, to say something, but um, really it wasn't easy to follow. Um, so here comes a engineer at the underground called Harry Beck and designs this for sort of a test run. It wasn't like initially well received by the people at the underground because they were all about their geography. And uh, as you can see, lines only really went uh, horizontally, vertically, and at a 45 degree angle. It wasn't geographically accurate, but they found that when people are down in the underground, they don't care about what's up. They just care about where they're going, where, where they're, where's their next stop, where they have to change trains. And really even to appease the geography nerds, they even included a little reference to, of the River Thames right at the bottom. Uh, and the model was successful. And as you can probably see from undergrounds everywhere else in the world, they all look exactly the same. Uh, they're all super useful. And I could go in a whole tangent, tangent about globalized design and how we can recognize like stop signs everywhere in the world, but I don't wanna go there right now. And, but really the question is, should our brands follow this same pattern based on best practices? So right now you can probably go on a bunch of different websites for um, software, really anything, and they all look virtually the same. They all follow those best practices, um, but unless you look beyond the characters with weirdly long limbs and fun colors, uh, the only way you can tell what business it is is to look beyond that, beyond the huge headline, and look at the little flat logo up on the top left. Um, and these businesses might be successful, but if we're trying to differentiate ourselves, how do we really do it? And that's how we arrive to emotional design. So if you've ever taken a psychology or consumer behavior class, you've probably seen this diagram. It's called Maslow's uh, Hierarchy of Needs. And it's a pretty way of, a uh, pretty neat way of organizing our needs as humans. So our physiological needs, safety, love and belonging, esteem, and self-actualization. And based on this, we can probably uh, switch it around and think of a way that we can adapt it for our uh, users and our customers needs. So we can organize it by if, for example, you're uh, creating a product or a website, which is obviously an extension and reflection of your brand. Um, it has to be functional, has to be reliable, it has to be usable. And that equivalent of something of self-actualization is for your product or website to be enjoyable. So this is where we put those emotional hats on. Um, Y'all have probably interacted with something, one of these three in uh, the past, they're um, very common sort of interactions of, uh, in our digital lives, that little bursting heart whenever we are liking a super clever tweet, uh, these range of emotions uh, that we can use on Facebook, like. Do y'all remember when we only had a like button? Uh, now we can express how we feel about something with all these different ways. And finally, a satisfying sort of visualization of hitting our fitness goals with an encouraging message. And these are all pretty simple, but they're, ba they're meant to connect with us and mess with all those neurotransmitters that are begging for attention and uh, connect with us in a deeper level. But as you probably know, joy really isn't the only emotion. So we have to think about all the range of emotions that we have. So this is an example of TurboTax's app uh, from a few years ago, but they've kept that same uh, thing going. So whenever you're filing a return for someone that's passed away, uh, they took on that moment and add a little condolence when uh, you're checking that box. And doesn't change the function of the app, doesn't do a whole lot for TurboTax, but again, they take on that moment and uh, probably connect with their customer on a deeper level. And it's just empathetic and caring. We took on this challenge recently uh, with a website redesign for Via Link, which is a, um, a nonprofit here in Louisiana and the 211 operator. Um, they deal with a lot of uh, super hard hitting uh, issues such as homelessness, 
uh, suicide prevention, child abuse, uh, to just name a few. And so one of the issues that we wanted to tackle is how do we make this website a resource that is friendly and encouraging for people? We didn't want to go for the stock photo shock value, obviously. So we created a whole uh, illustration language for them to use across their service pages. Um, and through Clarity and obviously all the excellent work we do, the, the website has been super successful. And just in the first year after launch, which was around 2018, uh, page views increased by 93% and average time on site increased by 40%. Again, I'm not saying just the illustrations were uh, the only thing, but uh, it certainly helped uh, make that site a better resource for the people who needed it. So how can you apply some of these things for your brand? Um, obviously, you would just start with living, breathing visuals. Uh, here are just a few examples of successful visuals in this space. Uh, you could opt for something like an anthropomorphic owl, which if you look into sort of the theory behind some of these cute little characters, apparently they stem from our very primal instinct of taking care of something cute like a baby instead of killing it. Um, you, uh, you could do something like what Google does, where they're not reinventing the wheel every time they make one of these doodles, but they just extend their brands to um, address like our times and things that are happening. Um, and you, if you're designing a product, you can do what used to be the case in uh, MacBooks, where you have a simple light that um, reflects human breathing when they're, they are sleeping, just to signal that your device is sleeping. Again, with product design, you can use materials, you can use textures and shapes that uh, are common in your home. And so that way, as uh, Sherrod and Levon were saying, the technology uh, recedes into the background, the design, design disappears, and that way it becomes a more human and natural experience. Or you can go for even something uh, more bold and use contrast and uh, alarming colors to call your attention. If you're in New Orleans, you probably have seen one of these on your windshield at some point. And through that very simple, but very bright envelope, uh, you're, in, you're obviously scared and you'll probably won't commit another violation uh, in the future. But visuals aren't the only part of this. Uh, there's obviously a personality aspect to it. So to give y'all another historical example, uh, which is a little visual, but uh, goes deep into like personality of things. Uh, this is Johannes Gutenberg on the left. He invented uh, the printing press. And before the, uh, his invention, uh, monks and uh, who are basically scribes had to write Bibles by hand. And this painstaking duty was seen as uh, a calling because of how long it took and uh, how intricate it was. But with Gutenberg's technological advancement, uh, he could obviously produce Bibles much faster, but he went a step further and cast these, uh, the typefaces on the printing press to reflect the same uh, strokes and typefaces that these um, monks were using to make the Bibles pretty much look the same. And he was able to preserve the authenticity, character, and overall humanity of these texts. Here's another little example that we use in internally and that you can probably apply to things like notifications or uh, items around your brand. So this is a quick automated check-in that goes out to my team every, uh, every day. Uh, there, it's a, there are a few that uh, come up throughout the day, but instead of coming up with a boilerplate message that can probably look annoying, uh, I try to go or something more relatable, more human. And every now and then I try to change them around uh, just to keep people engaged. And finally, who can forget about something like the I'm a PC, I'm a Mac commercial. And uh, really it's them, uh, it brings up the question of how you can bring up your brand's personality. And really it's just thinking of your brand as a human. Uh, in these commercials, there weren't a lot of props or any uh, effects or anything. Uh, really, it was two people acting completely different and showcasing the personality of two different products. And you can do this for your brand or the, uh, or the people using your brand by you uh, conducting 
honest uh, conversations with yourself, your team, your client, and identifying all of those traits and motivations that either your brand would have as a person or that your clients uh, and customers uh, have whenever they're looking for your product. Uh, just think about your brand's origin, its values, uh, its challenges, and use that information to craft the meaningful messaging that resonates with your users. And finally, we cannot uh, gloss over empathy and inclusion. Uh, and that doesn't only mean drawing characters that reflect the diverse audience. And while belonging and representation are super important, there are more challenging questions that you have to ask yourself uh, to make your brand and webs or website or product more inclusive. This is, and this is a framework, for example, uh, obviously this last part is uh, more of an open book because there are so many different things that you could tackle to make your uh, product or brand more equitable. Uh, but this was a framework that was developed by uh, Project Inkblot and it really addresses four core questions. Uh, so the first one is what is your customer's worst case scenario? So again, you don't only have to think about uh, the hopes you have for your user whenever they're interacting with you, but how they interact with you and or use your product in the real world. Uh, could there be something that you decided uh, for a process that you think is very clear cut because of your background, but might not seem very clear cut to someone else because of different experiences? And that goes on to the next question. How do I, our identities influence our decisions? Uh, many of those creative decisions, as I mentioned in that first uh, square exercise, stem from our backgrounds and our personal identities. So. Could we look beyond that and uh, make sure we're not overlooking uh, our customers because they have a different background? Which leads to the following question, who might you be excluding? I believe honestly that most people have the best intentions when they're creating a brand or a product or a website to uh, have it be inclusive for everyone, but just good intentions aren't, uh, don't mean that you might not be excluding someone uh, from your audience and uh, your design choices might not be accessible for uh, some people that might have different abilities. And finally, how can we engage with our audience equitably? And in really, I think this one is the most open-ended question, but it just leads more into, instead of making assumptions for your users, how can you involve them in that process? Uh, whether it's for a rebrand or a website, a product, and thinking of that, about the fact that uh, you're not, you should not only be thinking about the people that you intend to target, but think about all those other people who you might interact with anyways, and think about how you affect them by whatever you put out into the world. And so with all that said, um, we go back to this version of Maslow's pyramid, uh, the one we sort of put together for this and uh, find that your product not only has to be functional, reliable, usable, and enjoyable, but instead of enjoyable, it has to be emotional. Um, and so with that, uh, I know that my presentation might have raised more questions than it answered, but I hope that it got some of your creative gears turning and um, makes you think about how you can make your product, your brand, or your website uh, more human. Thanks. Back to you, Sam. Yeah, got it. Thanks, thanks, JP. That was an, an awesome presentation, and I really, you know, I'm astounded by how much psychology, again, as I said, goes into it. Um, and again, uh, I bought into that. I'm a PC, I'm a Mac commercial, so um, both of those presentations really hitting me hard here. All right, we are about to go into our Q and A section. So. Again, feel free to ask any questions in the Q&A pop-up and I'll ask them as they come through. Um, and, uh, and we've got a few questions already, so let's kind of get into it. Um, this one, okay, so we'll ask questions. Feel free to bounce the answers off each other and have an open discussion. It's more interesting that way, so uh, feel free to just kind of jump in. But this one was specifically for Levon and Sherrod. Um, what brands do you admire? Um, Shiraj, you want to start or? Yeah, I can start. Um, a brand that I think is brilliant, obviously, is the one everybody's going to say, and that's Apple. 
but I probably I probably like Apple for a different reason than most people. Um, I like how well Apple understands its customers. And one of the biggest complaints about Apple is probably what makes them the most genius from my perspective. And that's that everybody says they keep releasing the same phone over and over and over again in different ways. You know, it's, it's, it's the same operating system. It's, you know, they upgrade a little bit. But, you know, I'm going to leave this point. If you think about it, though, if you go way back, maybe say 15 years and you look at what the phones were and then you look at them today, 15 years is not a very long time in the grand scheme of things. And they have moved quite a ways. Your phone is now your music player. It is your video player. It is your search engine. It is your diary. It is your, it didn't start that way. So the progress that they've made over that period of time is amazing. But beyond that, let's think, you know, most of us at some point in our adolescence or adult life, we've eaten cereal, right? So you have your favorite cereal and let's say every morning you eat your favorite cereal. And then let's say one morning you wake up and there's a totally different brand of cereal with a totally different milk, totally different spoon in a totally different seat in the table. You know, you'd be like, what, in the, what, what is this, right? Couldn't happen. But if you woke up and your bowl was moved maybe an inch, and the milk just had a little bit of another type of a milk in it and a couple of kernels of another type of cereal, you eat it up and you wouldn't notice. But over time, you'd find yourself sitting at a totally different seat, eating a totally different meal over time. But you would not accept a sudden stark change quietly. That's the seat you find Apple in. So when you, find, when you ask yourself, why don't they evolve the phones faster? Because you would hate it. As much as you ask for it, you would absolutely hate it, right? But the genius of them being able to release these phones with incremental upgrades, sell millions, maintain their audience, and still be a pioneer in that space, I think is amazing. So Apple is my answer. Yeah, he's right. Everyone, everyone would say Apple, but I love that angle. I would go and say Amazon. And the reason I say Amazon is because they've stayed true to who they are. So the reason it's called Amazon is because they set out to have the largest bookstore in the world, which is what the name represents, right? And so if you look at the logo, it has an arrow from that points from A to Z. They sell everything from A to Z. And it also is a smile because they're obsessed with customer service, right? It's been that way from the beginning and it's that way now, which governs the evolution of how they do business, how you can get packages so quick, Amazon Prime, Amazon, you know, Prime Video, things of that nature. So I choose that brand because they've become so large, but they still remain true to why they started, which has been obsessed with making customers happy. I'm going to jump in and add a third one because, uh, yes, Apple obviously is, as, if anyone knows me, I love Apple. And he I loves Apple. live and breathe Apple. <laughs> um, but uh, PepsiCo is another brand that I admire, not only because they fed me their Kool-Aid whenever I was with them, but uh, I really like their corporate mantra that they had for a long time called performance with purpose. And it was pretty much a... Um, sort of like the, the DNA that say, they set out for their corporate environment and their products to, um, because a lot of their products are associated with not being healthy and everything, um, they set out a mission to make not only their products more uh, ha like healthier, but for um, anything they do to be, to have a positive impact on the environment and their supply chain. Uh, so I think that just connects with people a lot and um, addresses a lot of the concerns that consumers have nowadays. Yeah, absolutely. And I just wanted to, to go back to a note that I wrote down during your presentation, JP, about TurboTax with their yeah. condolence message. And that directly relates back to what Levon and Shra were saying. You know, they're selling taxes, but they're also selling that assurance that they gave you. Don't worry we're gonna make sure that your loved one's uh, filing is done correctly or, or you know, whatever the, the specific language was there. So that connection there of you're selling a quick and easy service, but you're also selling that assurance uh, and kind of getting behind the psychology of that is interesting. Um, all right, cool. This one was specifically for JP, um, but again, feel free to jump in. What's the best way to infuse emotion into design? Well, I, again, and I think it's just such a broad, um, maybe a broad answer, but uh, thinking of it as a human would, like whenever you're uh, designing a brand, designing, mess uh, creating messaging for something, how do you like 
to for someone to talk to you? How do you want to talk to your customers? Um, and I really try to take a very content centric approach to uh, design for a brand because it really all stems from how do you want that relationship to happen and uh, asking those questions, like whenever they interact with you, how do you want to make them feel? Do you want to make them feel happy? Do you want to make them feel uh, like ecstatic? Like if, uh, for example, if you're talking about a brand like Disney, if you're looking at an ad for them, uh, for like Disney parks, you want them to feel like it's magic, you know? Um, so think about those core emotions and drive your decisions through that. Levon Sherrod. I don't know if Levon or Sherrod have any additional points for that. Yeah, I think that was dead on. I would only add that sometimes when it comes to design, we try to look for what's pretty, but what's pretty is not always what's correct. So I would just say make sure you really understand your customer and make decisions based on attracting that customer. I think you're on mute, Sherrod. That's kind of the direction I was going to go with an answer. Um, what I'll say is, um, it, you know, it's very difficult to infuse emotion in a design. So the question is a great one, but the answer is, is not, there's no silver bullet, right? So I could sit here and design something. I used to be a designer in a past life. I could design something and I can say, this design looks happy, but then I can show the person sitting next to me and they could be like, what, I, I don't feel anything, right? So how do you gain consensus, which is what you're looking for, that whatever emotion you're trying to provoke, is actually being provoked. And the only way to do that is to ask questions. So this is why what big brands do is they test. They ask the customer, what do you hear us saying? I remember one time I had an experience, I was working with a major corporation, 500, well, I won't say major corporation, it was pretty big though, $500 million company. And uh, we were helping them with their language to their customers. Um, and they were a financial loan service. And they used the word responsible in their language, which from my perspective, you know, someone who has a small business, we do pretty well. If I think of a responsible decision or a responsible financial decision, that sounds logical. But if you are someone on the other end of that, where you're, you know, down and out and you're, you need, you know, a $500 loan, a $1,000 loan kind of a thing. If someone puts the word responsible on it, you're offended. They didn't find that out until they released the product and people wouldn't take the loan. When we changed the word responsible to simple, we saw a 25% increase in people applying. So we took responsible out and we said the simple option as opposed to the responsible option. There's no way we could have known that because from my seat, the word responsible makes sense to me, right? But not to the end customer. So the only way to really infuse emotion into a design is to understand the customer to LeVon and JP's point, but to understand your customer, you have to ask questions and listen. Absolutely. And I don't know if y'all saw it, but it goes directly back to a, a webinar we had, uh, you know, a couple of times ago about qualitative and quantitative data and, and really asking those questions and looking into focus groups and uh, doing surveys and things like that and really getting to the meat of it. Yep. Um, interesting. All right. Um, okay. Another one uh, for uh, Sherrod and Levon is, is what's one thing that business owners don't understand about branding and kind of how, how can we illuminate them? Um, this is something that I talk about a lot and I, I tapped on it a little bit in the presentation and that's positioning, right? And I'll talk about it from two different standpoints because I believe when you go into business, you go into an industry. And if we think of it that way, you could have 30, 40, 50,000 companies in an industry and studies show that we see 5,000 images per day. So that's a lot of white noise, right? So if you're Mercedes versus Honda, Mercedes has to understand my position and status. So it governs what I charge, it governs my color palette, it governs my locations, it governs the people I hire, right? And if I didn't understand that, those things would not connect, right? Versus Honda may be, well, we're selling reliability and all of those decisions are different. And so, but I'll also say as well, within your company, you have to position each product. So you have a $100,000 Mercedes, an 80,000, a 70, a 60, a 50, a 30, right? 
if you didn't understand that and you sold all one hundred thousand dollar cars, you have missed probably eighty percent of your market because you don't understand your position against competitors and your position within your organization. And so I think as small businesses, that's a lot. Of, those are a lot of things that we miss because, as you can see, it governs so many other decisions, and you can leave so much money on the table if you don't understand it. Yeah, I would like to add uh, to to uh, Sharad's point uh, to Levon's point that um, brand branding really isn't just about like your logo. It is so much more than just that. Uh, really your brand is everything you put into that. So I think something that's uh, sometimes misunderstood is that first, uh, maybe like a rebrand isn't gonna fix everything, every problem you have, like a new logo, a new whole look, you have to change a lot of other things uh, to make and to position yourself and uh, make you more successful. And two, when it comes to just design itself, like the Nike logo isn't magical. The Apple logo isn't magical. It's the companies behind them that have made those logos so recognizable and the, all the decisions they took to make their brands stand out. So whenever uh, a lot of designers, uh, or not designers, just a lot of people like to talk about proportions and like the Fibonacci ratio to drive their logos, like that is not a... A magic formula. Um, I don't. I don't buy into that. Yeah. Right. One thing I, Levon always says is that um, a logo doesn't gain its value until it's used. That's a, that's a quote that he uses a lot. And uh, yeah. so until then, it's it's a, it's a hollow image, right? And then you start to see it places. You it starts to gain association, and then it gains its equity. Um, to go back to the original part that Levon was talking about, um, I would really just say, you know, understanding the life cycle, well, under, un, first of all, in my opinion, going back to the example he used, Toyota being reliable, right? So how many pink Toyotas have we seen? You always use the example of the pink bank, LeVon, but you don't see a lot of pink Toyotas. Why? Because it's not a reliable color. So going back to LeVon's original point about how understanding what you sell, emotional intelligence and branding and marketing being, so I might be biased because I'm a marketer, but I think it's where you start. Most people wanna start with the business plan, they wanna start with the product. But I read a story about Captain Crunch. And if you guys read this book, I, for some reason the name of the book escapes me, but I read the book and they give, used Captain Crunch, Captain Crunch as an example. And they said that they did not make cereal until they gained consensus on the captain, the blue hat, the look and feel until they knew what the box was going to be they didn't even make a single kernel of cereal because marketing and branding informs everything if you choose to be a reliable color as a reliable brand as toyota did then that governs what colors you make you select that governs what you put in the engine that governs the wheels you put on the car that governs who you partner with that governs where you're located that governs your price point right because of the emotional space you feel and all of those decisions, even though they are emotional, also are brand decisions. They're branding. And then we get into the functional product piece. So I, I hope that point is driven home. Absolutely. Um, all right, we, we might go a minute or two over time, but we got one last question and I think it's really important to ask. So um, this one is directed toward JP, but again, jump in. Uh, in regard to making a website more equitable, are there specific tests or steps you can take to make it accessible for people with different abilities? That's a really good question. And it's uh, it, there's a whole debate about that uh, going on because if you follow like the news, like um, a few years ago, I think Domino's had a huge issue with like their pizza tracker not being accessible. They had to pay out a load of money. The uh, short answer is that there is no definitive test um, because there uh, something like the um, like the ADA guidelines don't specifically address websites. They just um, address something being uh, like the location of your business being accessible for people. And a lot of people take that towards websites because we're in a digital space now. Um, and so there's guidelines such as the WCAG guidelines um, that uh, give you uh, instructions on how to improve a lot of things throughout your website. And there's a lot of different tests you can do uh, with a lot of different tools. There's a lot of online ones that are free um, that you can use to 
see those res like those results and whether your website is accessible, but there is no one definitive test. Um, we try to always ad uh, address those um, points whenever we're creating a new website. We have a whole um, white paper about it on, on our site. Um, and it's, it's just a matter of like continuously improving, listening to your customers and um, just strive to be better about it. Yeah. In the government space, they use what you call 508 compliance. You familiar with that? Mm -hmm. Like the, uh, about, about sort of like, as it relates to like the ADA? Some similar. It's just got yeah. rules and guidelines that they use to just say, before we put out a product, um, it has to be 508 compliant. That's a good place to yeah. start if you, if you don't really um, know much about it. But I like uh, JP's point in that it's a commitment is essentially what he's mm -hmm. saying. You know, it's a commitment from you as an organization to say, this is important to us, it's gonna remain prioritized and we're gonna make sure it remains as, as, a, as a topic that we periodically revisit and make sure we brush up and stay abreast on. And I would say that's probably the best policy. I would say those guys had great answers. I have nothing to add. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, that wraps it up with our Q&A session. I gotta say, this was one of the most uh, interesting ones yet, for me at least, I really uh, enjoyed it. I wanna give another special thanks to our speakers, Levon Lewis and Shiraz Shackelford and Juan Pablo Madrid. Uh, again, Levon Lewis is the co-founder, president and creative director of Connect Branding and Shiraz Shackelford is the co-founder, CEO and chief strategic architect of Connect Branding. Connect Branding is an Atlanta-based award-winning and uh, branding and marketing firm, and I'll let them uh, tell you a little more about their organization. Yeah, I would just add that we've been around for 20 years. We've been fortunate enough to work with, you know, 2,000 companies from startups to nonprofit organizations, Fortune 100 companies. And, um, and we focus on everything from the strategy to anything digital. We've, uh, you know, done documentaries, just the core branding, things of that nature. So, um, you know, that's our organization. You can contact us at brandingconnected.com. Perfect. All right. Uh, so go follow their company online, uh, contact them, do the, do the whole thing. Um, Juan Pablo Madrid is the design director at Online Optimism, a full service digital marketing agency with offices in New Orleans and Atlanta. You can find our organization at onlineoptimism.com or on Twitter at Online Optimism. Um, perfect. Is there anything else before we wrap up? Big shout out to you, Sam. We appreciate what you guys are doing, your commitment to excellence. Guys, behind the scenes, these dudes are dedicated uh, and gals are dedicated to making this thing happen, uh, moving in excellence, staying very organized ahead of schedule. So just know that their online optimism and what they're doing, their commitment is there with you guys. So make sure you support the brand, make sure you support the movement. Uh, big thanks to everyone involved. I will share the same. Thank you to Sarah, Flynn, JP. Thank you guys. You, you as well, Sam. You've been awesome. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, again, don't forget to sign up for our webinar next week. Uh, we've got two more present uh, presentations to go and we'll be posting this link online. So thanks again and, and have a great day. Thank you. Thanks y'all. Bye. Bye.